Hello again and welcome to another 140 game Beoguard Tactics video. Now before we get into today's video I'd like to say a huge thank you to Max Zizu for sending in some awesome pictures of his Imperial Guard army. Star Wars themed Imperial Guard is just awesome and Max this is one of the best examples I have ever seen of a Star Wars Warhammer 40k army. From the Vader to the Boba Fett to the Krennic, all of it just looks really, really cool. And it's just, you can just tell so much love and effort has been put into the army. So thank you for sending these pictures in. They're really awesome. If anyone else has got any cool pictures they want me to use in my videos, then please post them on my Facebook page or you can email them to me at mordinglorytv at gmail.com. And don't worry if you're an ogre who's not had his bonehead surgery yet, there will be links to both of those things down in the description below. Without further ado, let's crack on with today's video. So today guys, I want to talk about Militarum Tempestus Science, the stormtroopers for you longbeards out there. It seemed only appropriate to talk about these boys when we had some Star Wars models on the channel. Now, stormtroopers, Scions, have had a bit of an interesting path in 9th edition so far. At the beginning of 9th edition, I was using my Scions a lot. They were one of the few glimmers of hope that Guard had at remaining competitive. Uh, but a lot has changed since then, and slowly but surely, as the meta changed and new armies came out and balanced data slates and supplements were available, I moved away from my Scions and I started using regular Guard a bit more. But after the most recent change, we're talking to, with Nephilim, we're talking with balanced data slates, talking with points and all that kind of good stuff, I wanted to revisit my Scions and be like, where are the glory boys now? Where are the big toy soldiers right now in terms of just power in relative to the rest of the guard? But also, how powerful are they in the meta? What buffs have they had and how has that affected the army? So that's what we're going to be covering today, boys. So strap in, we're going to be talking all things Scion. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the balanced data slates. Because over the last couple of balanced data slates, the way that Scions are able to play has changed significantly. You see, the first thing to mention is now in the latest balance data slate, Scions get access to Armour of Contempt and they get access to Hammer of the Emperor, but they, which are two really strong rules for them. But they've also taken a bit of a nerf in the fact that now all aircraft for every army are limited to two models, which means no longer is Air Cav Scions really an option. Now, Air Cav was never a really super ultra top tier competitive way of playing the guard but it was a fun play style and it certainly had its moments and if, if an opponent wasn't ready for it having a whole army of you know toughness 7 14 wound 3 up save minus 1 to hit vehicles was actually kind of difficult for an opponent to deal with especially when coming out of those vehicles is a whole load of glory boys packed with melter and plasma and other good stuff it definitely caught people off guard and you could you know you could win a couple of games if you went to a tournament with it now that playstyle is essentially dead, so that's kind of the first thing to acknowledge. Scions now are not so much an air cavalry force, they're very much more of a ground pounding force. And if you want to have maneuverability where you can get behind your opponent, you're going to be relying upon that deep strike a lot more. Which is absolutely fine because, hell, at least they sort of get deep strike bait into their points cost, which is great. However, whilst air cav might have taken a bit of a kicking... Regular ground pounding styles in Toroxes have had a lot of buffs from recent changes. So now you're looking at things like Armour of Contempt. Now for those that don't know, Armour of Contempt is a rule that Games Workshop has recently been rolling out. And essentially, Imperial Guard have now got it on their vehicles. This doesn't apply to infantry. To be really, really clear, the following rule does not apply to your Scion infantry, but it will apply to all of your vehicles. Now, if you're running a pure Scion army, you're going to be looking at things like Valkyries, Vendettas, Vultures, but most importantly, you're going to be thinking about Torox Primes. So what the hell is Armour of Contempt? Morning Glory, stop teasing us. Stop being a Sonesh little teaser and just tell us what Armour of Contempt is. Well, many of you already know what this rule is, but for those of you that may be coming back to Scions after a while, Armour of Contempt means that you reduce the AP of any attack, be it ranged or close combat, by 1. So that means if someone hits you with an AP 1 attack, it becomes AP 0. If someone hits you with an AP 2 attack, it becomes AP 1. If someone hits you with AP 3, it becomes AP 2, so on and so forth. Now, it doesn't affect mortal wounds. Obviously, they don't have an AP value. They just wound you. Uh, but it's still really, really powerful to have this rule on, on all your vehicles, especially when the fact that Torox Primes a pretty bloody spammable. You know, a DACA Prime, which is my preferred way of running them, will only set you back about 120 points. And that bad boy just got a heck of a lot more durable. So it's a really, really big buff. 
It's also really nice for Valkyries to have it as well. Valkyries being sort of the principal other codex vehicle that the Scions get access to. Not only Valkyries were already pretty tough. I've remarked, I've had a number of people remark on the durability of the old Valkyrie because it's 14 wounds, which people don't expect. It's minus one to hit because it's a flyer and you can keep it at minus one to advance countermeasures, but you're probably not going to spend that anymore with the CP chains. But we'll get to that in a little moment. But it's minus one to hit, it's 14 wounds, it's a three up save, and it's toughness seven. Most flyers, if you think about it, guys, most flyers you encounter are what, like toughness six? So being tough for seven with a three up save is actually pretty nice. Now it's got essentially an extra eight, you know, ignore minus small AP on that. So now it's even more durable. So the flying tank, as I like to call it, is actually even more tanky. So I think that Daka Primes are still maybe the more premier unit, but a couple of Valkyries or even just one Valkyrie in your army isn't going to punish you anymore. And in fact, it's going to be one hell of a durable gunboat flying around as well. So, Arm of Contempt is really, really big, but I know I've focused a lot on the Flyers, but I just want to say, I think the Daka Primes really get the most out of it, because they're just so goddamn spamble. 120 points, you can get five of those bad boys for 600 points, they're going to come with so much firepower, and they're going to be durable to boot. But speaking of firepower, now let's talk about Hammer of the Emperor, which is another incredible, fantastic buff that your Scions now get access to. So Hammer of the Emperor is an army-wide rule that GW has introduced over the last couple of balanced data slates, and it's a really, really powerful one. It's clear that GW are giving Guard this rule because they know that Guard are struggling and they don't want Guard players to just become totally disillusioned with the game. So Hammer of the Emperor applies to now pretty much every Guard unit in the game. It, for a time, it didn't apply to Scions, but as per the latest balanced data slate, it now does. Now what the hell is, is Hammer of the Emperor? Basically, for ranged attacks, so not combat attacks, guys, but for ranged attacks, if you get a six to hit, you automatically wound. Now that is incredible for Scions for a number of reasons. Firstly, Daka Primes. Daka Primes specialize in having a huge amount of firepower. The Daka Prime, by the way, is when you put a Gatling cannon on top and you put the hot drop volley guns on the side and you put a storm bolter in the lid as well so that your tank is always firing between 30 and 32 shots. It's a really, really nice um, way of running your Toroxes. I don't like the missile launcher axe. How I run my Toroxes is the Daka Primes do the, do the horde control and the Scions take the plasma and the melt and they do the punchy and they kill the big stuff. Now, going back to Hammer of the Emperor, the reason it's so good on Torx Primes is because they have such a high volume of fire. If you're taking 30 shots from each Torx Prime, that's going to be statistically five auto wounds every single time. And don't forget, if you're running your Daka Primes Land and Lion, which you probably still want to do because you really need the AP on those Daka Primes, then you're running a vehicle which is putting out 20 my AP minus one shots. That's likely to get you, plus the Storm Bolt as well, so you're looking at like 22. That's likely to get you like three auto wounding minus one. And then you've got the Hot Drop Volumes as well, which is going to add another two. And that's just fantastic. So you're looking at about five auto wounds, three of which are AP one and two of which AP three if you're taking Land Alliance on those Volley Guns. That is really, really powerful. Don't forget, you then get all the other shots, you know, the other shots that still get a chance to wound. So you could easily, from all the other hits, because bear in mind you hit on threes, so you've still got like another 10 hits coming through. Even if you're shooting like a toughness seven vehicle, you're looking to add maybe three or four more wounds on top of that. You could easily look at a Daka Prime now doing eight to nine wounds against a vehicle. That's that's pretty gnarly, not gonna lie. You might struggle a little bit when you start coming across knights and stuff, but again, you're not struggle too much because you don't care about the toughness of the knight. So the great thing about Hound Emperor is it gets round one of the Torx Primes' key weaknesses, which is it's got high volume of fire, but its strength is a little bit low when you're taking it in the DACA configuration. Now, you don't really care about strength. You just care about doing as many auto wounds as possible, and now you get great AP on top of that. So it's really, really effective. Now, the other thing to mention about um, Hammer of the Emperor is with your regular Scion squads. So before, there was always this idea of maybe if you took like a big 10-man squad of Scions and you jumped out and you lasted on something, you might be able to do a bit of AP manage through damage to them. 
Now you're more than likely to do a hell of a lot of AP3 damage to them because if you take a squad of Scions and you get them into rapid fire range and they've got first rank fire, second rank fire, they're going to get 36 shots which means six of those statistically should hit on sixes and get Hammer of the Emperor, and that's six wounds at AP3 just from a, a 90 point Scion squad. So it's still pretty bloody gnarly. It's really, really powerful. Combine this with another buff that Scions have had over the last few data slates, which is now, basically, if you do an order, it can be spread across multiple units. So it used to be one order for one squad. Now, if you order a squad, and they're within six inches of another squad, both squads get the same order. And if you've got multiple squads in six inches of each other, then you can essentially get one order to proc out across two, three, four units, which is really, really powerful. So Scions can now lasgun things to death. However, I wouldn't recommend that as like a go-to way of doing it because you're still gonna want the time when you need something that does more than one damage. You're gonna want Melty, you're gonna want Plasma, you're gonna still want those things, but having a sing maybe a single 10-man squad that can just jump out of the Toxic Lasguns and hose something down, it's definitely something you're gonna want to consider. Bear in mind, guys, that you know you can get your Scions hitting on threes, re-rolling uh, ones very easily uh, with if you land on lines because you can then get access to keys to the armory. And then if you do the Scion Regiment specific order elimination protocol sanctioned, you can get full re-rolls to wound on the Lasgun shots that hit but don't hammer of the Emperor. So a single Lasgun squad could actually do really, really well at get mowing down vehicles as well as mowing down tanks but like I said you're still going to want those times where you need a bit of plasma a bit of melter but now I think a lot of cyan armies are going to be you're going to find them fielding a single big 10-man squad which can just jump out and hose things down now speaking of that let's take a look at the Scion squads themselves. How have they changed over the last few data slates? So traditionally, you would find your Scion squad is equipped with a couple of plasma guns, a plasma pistol on the sergeant, they drop down, they'd be a little five-man squad, and the reason you did that is you wanted to get as many five-man squads as possible, because they were more tactically flexible, and you could easily you know, get more special weapons on the field. Now, that has changed somewhat under the new CP regime, because Previously, you got 12 command points, and there was no real issue with spending six of them taking a couple of extra sound attachments because you want to be able to get access to more five-man squads. Now, you're probably going to struggle with that. You're probably going to be limited to, like, two detachments. Uh, maybe even you're going to find yourself limited to one detachment because you used to get a free relic. You used to get a free warlord trait. Now you have to pay for both of those. So if you take two detachments... If you take two battalions, for example, you, that's, you only start with six CP. You're spending three CP on that battalion. Then you're spending a CP on your warlord trait for keys of the army. Then you're spending a relic on uh, a CP on relic for refractory shield generator. Then you might want to spend another CP for progeny of conflict. And then you're starting with zero CP. That's not a good situation to be in at all. So I really think that what you're going to find is you're going to find that there's going to be more Scion players taking a single detachment. And because they're going to be taking a single detachment, what you're going to find is they're going to be taking big 10-man Scion squads. So for me, how I'm thinking this might end up working out is you have an army where you take a single battalion, you take six 10-man squads, five of those squads are going to be outfitted with Melter and Plasma, and then you're going to end up, and one is going to be bare bones at Lasgun, so you can just jump that and hose something down. And then you're probably going to be taking your three command squads and three Tempesta Primes. Now, the advantage of taking everything under one detachment means that you now no longer have to pay for like a tax unit like the Lord Commissar. And you don't need to worry about making the Lord Commissar Master Command to get more orders because your orders should be absolutely fine now with the way they all proc out. So it shouldn't actually, whilst you're being forced down to a, a less flexible structure, you are taking less tax units as well, which is great. Now, if you take six squads of Scions and you take three Tempesta Primes, you're going to want to take those command squads. Now, there is a temptation under the new secondaries that guard get to take those command squads with like banners and flat and medics and vox casters, all that kind of good stuff. I would probably avoid doing that. The reason I'd avoid doing that is you're already restricting the number of special weapons you're going to be getting due to the fact that you're now essentially realistically stuck on six 10-man squads. So 
You're still going to want those command squads to be loaded with Melter and Plasma, and they're still going to be dropping down and being your precision scalpel unit to just ultimately say fuck off to one particular enemy unit you don't want to deal with anymore. I cannot tell you the number of times when I have just dropped down three command squads loaded up with Melter, every single one of them, and just been like, that one enemy unit that has to die, it's now going to die. So that's definitely something you're going to want to be bearing in mind when you're using your silent command squads. You're also going to want to bear in mind that some of the other secondaries like Inflexible Command may not be as suitable for your silence as they once were because either you're going to be starting in transports or you're going to be deep striking in so it gets a little bit tricky on how you can make the most out of Inflexible Command. So just something to be aware of when it comes to secondaries and army composition. How I see my, side, my own silent army working out is I think I'm going to be taking six big squads, three command squads, three Tempest of Primes, and then probably going to take something like a big squad of Crusaders and a Priest to have that nice combat element in there, and it's still good to be able to have a smidge of combat. And then the rest of it's going to be every Torx, Prime, and Valkyrie that I can fit into my list, basically. And I'm going to have a lot of armor, and the armor, thanks to how the Emperor, is going to pick up a little bit of the slack due to me having a few less special weapons, due to me having less five-man squads and being forced down to more ten-man squads. Now, I know a question that many of you will be asking is, but what about regiment traits, Morning Hood Warrior? What do you think we should be taking in this new Scion world in terms of Militarm Tempestus regiment traits? Now, I've obviously hinted strongly at Land and Lions throughout this video. I'm just going to confirm it now. I still think Land and Lions are the strongest way to go when it comes to taking Stormtroopers. A couple of reasons for this. One, their trait is always on. It's always going to be useful. There are going to be very few games when you get into a situation where, ha where having extra AP is going to be a problem. You might encounter someone like Harlequins. Fine. That's the one exception, but most of the time, having extra AP is really, really good. Especially because we ain't the only ones with armor content, boys. If you come across Marines and Blood Angels and that kind of power armor stuff, and now you've got Chaos around the corner as well, you're going to be coming across a lot of power armor. You're going to be coming across a lot of enemy armor of contempt. And in that situation, you're going to really be grateful that you took the extra AP. Trust me. Now, I still think that there is some wiggle room for some of the other regiments though i think land and lions are good but i think capic eagles are now a strong strong contender if you're going to be taking a lot more toroxes and people jumping out of torox as well the fact that now you don't need as many officers and orders and all that kind of stuff i definitely think that having a loads and loads of volley guns and plasma guns and melter guns jumping out of torxes getting plus one to hit and being able to have one officer give them all reroll ones that is really really strong hitting on twos rolling ones is fantastic and volley guns you know volley guns have a special place because they give you four shots you don't need to have first one fire second one fire on them and that's a lot of hammer of the emperor so i think capic eagles kind of work and in a funny sort of way how i see kind of capic eagles working is you're going to be taking as many mechanized squads as possible, as many Torx Primes as possible. And you're going to be loaded. And you, I think Capic Eagles, you might be able to get away with not having as much. Well, I, th I, think you're still going to, I think you're still going to need your plasma and your melt and everything. But it's going to be hitting really, really often, which is great. Basically, if you're Capic Eagles, you're going to be hitting on twos and rolling ones nearly all the time now. You're going to be jumping in and out of Torx, just having a great time. So... Definitely think Capic Eagles are strong. Another strong contender, I think, are the Iotan Gorgons and the other regiment that lets you get exploding sixes because now you can get loads and loads and loads of shots and hits and auto wounds and stuff because if every shot that you have, when you get a six, not only auto wounds, but then there's another hit as well. Yeah, you have to roll to wound for it, but still, that's really, really powerful. You're just layering on loads and loads and loads of extra exploding six goodness. I think if I had to rank the three regiments in terms of useful, uh, well, the top three regiments in terms of usefulness, I would say it goes Land and Lions, then Capic Eagles, then the Iotan Gorgons. I think that's really, really powerful. Because don't forget, you've got those Iotan Gorgons you can like drop in within five inches. And yeah, it's really, really powerful. So I would probably say it goes those three regiments, Land and Lions, Capic Eagles, Iotan Gorgons. But that's just my instinct on this one. To be honest, boys, I'm kind of a pure Land and Lions player, but... 
I obviously can look at the other regiments and give a good sort of gut instinct on how they're going to play. Now, one other thing to mention before we get into the where are Scions competitively now bit is just want to have a little bit of a talk about the Scion CP game at the moment. Previously, Scions had a really heavy CP game. You could do things like take extra Warlord traits, you could take extra Relics, which you pretty much wanted to do. Uh, you were going to be putting, if you took Valkyries, you'd be putting advanced countermeasures on them, so they could be really effective gunboats. Uh, you had things like full charge, you had things like Gifts of the Mechanicus, you had things like um, Decept Dare and Descent, and all this kind of stuff that you could do. A lot of that's going to be scaled back now. A lot of it, because whilst a lot of the science stuff only costs one CP, you really don't have as much CP to start with as you like. I'm not sure how you're going to do your science CP game, but I certainly think you're probably going to be either spending a lot of them pre-game and then and then like a little bit throughout, or you're going to be saving them for those big scion pushes. So you could take two detachments, as we mentioned, but then if you want to, if you're going to land the lines, you have to take your sort of mandatory keys to the arm of a refractor field generator that's you start with one cp which is a little rough i'm not gonna lie uh, if you then take things like valkyries you want to be doing dare and descent and whatnot then you know you're really going to be struggling for taking advantage of gifts of the mechanicus and full charge and all that kind of stuff so for me i'd probably go down the route of then you can't even take advanced countermeasures as well so it's tricky Bear in mind, if you're going land on lines, you're only really starting on 4 CP because you're definitely going to take Gifts of the Mechanicus and you're definitely going to be taking, um, not Gifts of the Mechanicus, sorry, Keys to the Armoury and you're definitely going to be taking Refractor Field Generator. I think my, my instinct is you take the one detachment and that gives you access to a lot more CP game. If you take the one detachment and then with a couple of Valkyries, then you're going to be, and you want to give them advanced countermeasures, then you start on your 2 CP. So, yeah, I think that's probably the way I'd do it. However, you've got to bear in mind, there's a lot less CP you need to spend pre-game. You do not need Progeny of Conflict anymore. You don't need to be spamming extra orders. You've got all the orders you're ever going to need, thanks to the new orders spreading out across multiple units, Malarkey. You also don't need to be taking the extra relic. Most people would take uh, the keys, uh, the refractory generator and then the auto relic with Tiberius. You don't need that anymore. The Auto Relic of Tiberius gave you an extra order on 2+. You don't need the extra orders anymore. You're going to be ordering fine. Like I said, things are going to be procking left, right and centre. If in doubt, you know, you can spend a CP on Inspired Command, but that CP you, you can choose when to spend it rather than spending it pre-game and then maybe not needing it. So the Science CP game has kind of balanced out, but it really depends on how many detachments you're taking. Taking extra detachments is really, really difficult now. Especially if you want those relics and warlord traits, which I think land and lines of scions really, really need. But now let's take a look at where do scions fit in competitively? Are they better or are they worse? Well, unequivocally, I can say that I think scions are way better off now. Way better off. Hammer of the Emperor is insane on scions. And there's a reason why GW sort of gave it and took it away, and I'm surprised they've given it back to them, but. Use it whilst you can, lads, because it is such a nice, powerful rule. Armour of Contempt makes Torx Primes, what were previously quite flimsy vehicles, a little bit more durable. Now, they're not going to be a Lehman Rust. They're not going to be tanking melts to the face or anything like that. But having a vehicle which has got a 3 plus save, ignores AP1 if it's near the refractor field generator, it's got a 5 from the level save, that's pretty nice. It's pretty nice indeed. I think you're going to find a lot of Torx Primes not getting popped in one go, you might find that the enemy has to rededicate some firepower to getting rid of them, which is again, very, very nice. So I think overall, Scions are now, they've regained their mantle. I would say they've certainly regained their mantle as one of the top ways of playing guard. My instinct is that, the, the, that it goes mech guard or armor guard is the best way of playing guard at the moment, and then it's followed by Scions and then it's followed by Hybrid Guard. But I would certainly say that Pure Scions are now in probably one of the top, they're definitely one of the top three ways of playing your Imperial Guard army. They're really, really strong. The fact that now you don't have to worry so much about orders, the fact that Hammer of the Emperor gets around one of the traditional weaknesses of your army, which is that you've got great AP but weak strength, you don't care about strength anymore, you're just looking for sixes to hit, 
and the fact that your traditionally flimsy glass uh, glass hammer style play is now a lot less glass hammer because you've got armor contempt on all those buggies, which is great. The only thing I would say that holds them back is they're a little bit less flexible now. I mean, having multiple five-man squads was really, really good for tactical flexibility. And now being forced down 10-man squads doesn't feel great. I'm not going to lie. But hopefully you'll be able to make that up with the fact that you're going to have more and more Torox Prime, which is really, really good. So overall, I think Sands are in a better place. They've had overall a positive buff, but there have been a few nerfs, such as CP and squads being made a bit less flexible. But that's it for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please consider giving it a like and a subscribe and all that good stuff. Just any kind of interactivity really, really helps with the algorithm and the video being more discoverable. And if you've really enjoyed today's video, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. It really makes a huge difference. To be honest, without the channel members, without the Patreon supporters, I wouldn't still be doing the YouTube stuff. And so their general support is what allows me to keep going, especially now that Morning Glory TV is my full-time gig, guys. So massive thank you to all the channel members, all the Patreon supporters. I want to do a shout out for our latest supporters. So massive thank you to Justin Hoji, Neo Cosmopolis, Eric McCombs, Dwarf Hammer, Caligula, Ryan Hancock and Silent Warrior for signing up and becoming channel members. Thank you guys for doing your part. I also want to say thank you to the latest channel Patreons as well. So thank you, Gan Kistani, Ben Thorne, Alon Harfin, Marcus Roberts, Timothy Jägermeister and Jesse Cashman. Thank you guys, really appreciate the support. And finally, but certainly not least, I want to say a huge heartfelt thank you to all of the top tier Patreon supporters. These are the guys and girls which have gone absolutely the extra mile when it comes to supporting the channel. And it's really, really just, it's amazing the generosity these guys have showed. So massive heartfelt thank you, a personal thank you to August Varney, John Stubbs, Nicholas Walsh, and Swordfish Trombone for being signed up at the Lord General level, the top tier of support for the Morden Glory Patreon. I also want to give a shout out and a thank you to our Commissar level Patreon supporters as well. So massive thank you to Diesel Fox, Shooter McGavin, Tom Sutton, and Ross Miller for being signed up at the Commissar level. Really appreciate the support, guys. But that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed today's video, and as always, I'll see you guys next time.